Okay, well, thank you uh, very much, everyone. And I'll just uh, oh, start with a word of clarification. Fishes is, in fact, a correct plural, if you were wondering about that. Uh, for those of us who study fishes, fish is plural for a, uh, individuals from a single species, and fishes is a plurality of species. So there's your little grammatical lesson. That's it for grammar today. Uh, I figured at C to C to Sky, we need to have at least one fish talk in, uh, in this program. So I'm sure uh, you have all read Genesis 1 numerous times. I've read it hundreds of times. And I always glossed over Genesis 1.22, and it was only after I started studying fish that this really struck me, that God blessed the fish. This is on day five of the creation account, before humanity ever arises on the scene. God blessed the fish and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas. Now this word, Bless, is, it's a fascinating word uh, in, in uh, Hebrew, and I'm clearly not a Hebrew scholar, and I do not intend to go through all the ramifications of this word, but just to point out that this is a word that crops up throughout the book of Genesis in a lot of really interesting situations. We have this word bless uh, in Genesis 2-3 in reference to the Sabbath, that God blesses the Sabbath. We have it in the account of Noah, in the account of Abram. In fact, God says that all the nations of the world will be blessed through Abram, and it is the same word that God uses in association with the fishes. In other words, this, this blessing to be fruitful and increase in number uh, doesn't strike me as just a sort of willy-nilly hope. It's not like a have a good day sort of mentality. It's a, it's a promise that the fish will be fruitful, the fish will multiply. When we move to Genesis 1.28, we see this, a, a similar blessing being given to humans. God blessed us, and said, be fruitful and increase in number, and immediately follows this up with the command to rule over the fish of the sea. In other words, we, we have a blessing being given to the fish, and then our responsibility is given to ensure that that blessing occurs. And as this image shows, we don't always do a particularly great job at uh, ensuring that this blessing is fulfilled. In fact, we, we have this weird power to counteract the blessing of God. And we see this in particular with the collapse of, of the cod fishery, which is what got me interested in uh, fisheries biology in the first place. Here we have the single greatest loss of a vertebrate in Canadian history. The total uh, biomass of, of lost fish uh, was equivalent to the total biomass of Canadians, uh, if not slightly higher. So what you see on this graph here is total catch in tons of, of Atlantic cod. Uh, and you see a peak in the 1970s. This isn't because there were suddenly more cod, it's because factory trawlers were created. And these factory trawlers could go out to the spawning grounds of the cod uh, and, and have freezers on board so they could extract fish from their spawning grounds, freeze them and preserve them, and be gone for weeks at a time before they go back to shore. What you see here is the amount of, of Atlantic cod being caught in the early 90s, right before the fishery was shut down. And it's not that uh, people were no longer trying to catch cod, the effort is the same, if not higher, the cod just weren't there. So we have this uh, tension between competing flourishings. Humanity desires to flourish, and in this flourishing we require protein, and fish are uh, a, a, an important source of that protein. But our flourishing can come at the cost of the flourishing of the fishes, and I suggest that we need, as we see in the East Coast, we need both flourishing fishes uh, to maintain flourishing humans. We need to have co-flourishing. Uh, we see a, another theme in Genesis 2.20, although admittedly this doesn't have, it doesn't mention fish, but we have, as you know, Bob Dylan uh, put it, man gave names to all the animals in the beginning. And I suggest that naming is an important component of flourishing. That's what I'd like to, to really focus on today. If, uh, one particular case study on Calgary's fish food problem, but I'll open with two uh, smaller illustrations. Here we have two different species of hyodontids. We have the moon eye and the gold eye. Now, to the casual observer, these, these may appear to be the same species, but there are slight differences in the position of the dorsal fin in relation to the anal fin and other sorts of things that distinguish these two species, and they're reproductively isolated. We have both of these fish in, in Alberta, and they're both an important recreational fish. There's a lot of money being made uh, by recreationally harvesting these fish. But it wasn't until the 1970s that the Alberta government recognized that we had two distinct species in the province. Outside of Alberta, people recognized the difference between moon eye and gold eye, but not in Alberta. 
So Alberta was managing a fishery as if you had only one species. They're only naming one thing. And you can't properly manage a fishery if you're naming things incorrectly. You need to give it the correct name in order to be able to uh, actually manage it. Uh, here's another example uh, that I just find fascinating. What you're looking at here are the number of extinct and extirpated species of fish in Canadian history as estimated by the general status of wild species in Canada. This is the federal government report that's been put out um, over multiple years where they try to name every species of everything found in Canada and give the conservation status of that species. What you see is that the number of extinct species is declining with every report. Now this is the total number of extinct species in Canadian history, and yet it's declining with each report. Why is it declining? It's declining because they're changing what they consider worthy of naming. What they consider worthy of naming. So here, we have a benthic stickleback and a limnetic stickleback. Uh, here in uh, British Columbia, these exist as species pairs in multiple lakes uh, across British, or well, I guess along Vancouver Island and some of the Gulf Islands. They're unique in, in the world. These are reproductively isolated. They do not reproduce with each other in the wild. So they fulfill the biological definition of true species. The problem is they all evolved from a marine three-spined stickleback and they evolved independently in each lake which means each benthic stickleback is a different species from every other benthic stickleback, and every limnetic is a different species from every other limnetic, which makes it really complicated to name things uh, legislatively. And so scientists have decided to just call this a three-spine stickleback species complex. So it only has one scientific name. So here the government decided, in certain lakes where these had gone extinct, to name them as such. And they decided later on these are no longer worthy of naming. And so they removed them from the fish list. They're just three-spine stickleback. They're nothing unique. So naming uh, goes hand in hand with flourishing. You go to restaurants and you order fish and chips. And I, I've been guilty of doing this. What in the world do you mean by that? How many of you have gone to a restaurant lately and asked for a mammal sandwich? <laughs> you want to know the exact type of mammal that you're eating. Is it a sheep? If it is a sheep, is it a lamb? You even want to know how old this thing is. Right? Is it goat? Is it a uh, cow? Is it dog? Is it horse? It matters to you what this thing is. There are more species of fish on this planet than there are mammals, reptiles, birds, and amphibians combined. For 40,000 species of fish, what do you mean by fish and chips? Well, thankfully, the Canadian government has uh, laws put in place that require the labeling of fish products. So even if you order fish and chips, somewhere on the label it says haddock and chips or halibut and chips. So you have some sense as to what you're actually eating. Uh, there are laws regarding naming. The problem is our fish products tend to be unidentifiable. So you have to trust the label that you're receiving. Uh, we often get headless, skinless fillets. We have samples of sushi. The other night at uh, the Sky Gala, we all had those little uh, crackers with some red flesh on it. And I, I imagine, like you, you just assumed you were eating salmon. Salmon at least has some distinguishing characteristic. It's color. But you can feed fish carotenoids and change the color of their tissue. So you can feed domesticated rainbow trout and make them look like Atlantic salmon. So we don't have these distinguishing features. And so this could be a problem. We have particular names on our menus, but do those names correspond to what you're actually eating? So the question that I have here is, is what you bought actually what you got? I stole this from an Oceana report, uh, this terminology, but I think it's effective. Is what you bought what you got? And how do seafood labels affect the co-flourishing of humans and fish? So I said, when you buy this tissue, it doesn't come with distinguishing features, it just comes with a label. But in fact, it does have a distinguishing feature if you know how to look. The University of Guelph has initiated something called DNA barcoding. So this tissue contains within it DNA. And that DNA has a, uh, a mitochondrial genome, and that mitochondrial genome has a gene called cytochrome C oxidase 1, and about a 600 base pair region of that DNA is relatively good at resolving to the species level. So what you can do is sequence this region of DNA, and it acts like a barcode, just like you would have a barcode at the supermarket. You scan it and it tells you exactly what that product is. You sequence this region of DNA, 
and it tells you what kind of fish you have when you compare it to uh, a fish database that's been generated by the University of Guelph. So you can determine if what you bought is what you got or if it's mislabeled. Now to guide our definition of mislabeling, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency has a fish list. And this fish list sets up the names that fish can legally be called when they're being sold. So on the left here, I've given three species examples. We have Gaddis macrocephalus, Gaddis morua, and Gaddis ogak. These are three members of the genus Gaddis. These are all types of cod. And on the right are the things that they can legally be named under the Canadian Food Inspection Agency fish list. Let's point out a few features of this. You can go to the grocery store one day and buy Pacific cod, and go back to the grocery store the next day and buy gray cod, and you've just purchased the same species each day. Those are two legally acceptable names for Pacific cod. You could go to the grocery store one day and buy cod, and the next day go to the grocery store and buy cod, and you've just bought two different species legally without you being aware of it. You bought the Pacific cod, which is doing fine. You bought the Atlantic cod, which is protected and vulnerable. So there's some ambiguity built in to the fish list. Greenland cod can't be called cod legally. It has to be called Greenland cod or ogan. So there's some ambiguity built into this fish list. There's some specificity built into this fish list. And so this is the guide Despite its limitations, this is the guide for determining if a sample has been mislabeled. So in 2014, 2016, and 2017, in conjunction with undergraduate um, courses, uh, a Principles of Genetics course at Ambrose University, and two molecular ecology courses at the University of Calgary and uh, Mount Royal University, <coughs> undergrads went out and they sampled fish from various vendors around Calgary. So we collected 203 samples of fish products that were being sold. Uh, 105 of them came from sushi vendors, 82 from grocery stores or fish markets, and 16 came from restaurants. This was primarily filet of fish from McDonald's um, and a few uh, uh, breaded fish from restaurants. But these samples are substantially more expensive, so our sampling was limited uh, for restaurants. In total, based on the labels that we received, uh, the market names, there are about 49 potentially distinct species that we sampled. And so students collected the samples, they took photos of the sample, so this is uh, a, a sample of uh, uh, sushi or sashimi uh, from uh, Nigeria Sushi. They took a photo of the, uh, of the receipt. So we have, and, and often of the menu, so we have a record of what it was being marketed as. So you can see it's called Thai, which is not a legal name under CFIA, that's a sushi name. But in brackets, they rescue themselves and put in snapper. So you have some sense as to what you're getting and a price. They then uh, preserved the sample, sent it to the University of Guelph for sequencing, and this is the barcode that comes back. Every color here is a different nucleotide, one of the four nucleotides. They then put it into a database, and we get a hit, 100% match with a fish called Oreochromis. If you know anything about your fish, snapper belongs to Sebastes, Oreochromis is tilapia. So you bought snapper, and what you received was tilapia. You bought a marine fish, you got a freshwater domesticated fish. So here's how it turned out. About a third of Calgary's seafood was mislabeled under Canadian Food Inspection Agency guidelines. So we had 70 mislabeled and 133 uh, legally labeled samples. And I'm going to walk you through a couple different types of mislabeling from this. So I'm going to start breaking up this section of the pie chart. You can just follow uh, that along. Eight of these, as indicated here, are what I call technically mislabeled seafood. These are the ones that aren't particularly interesting. So a student bought freshwater eel. That's just not a legal name. No matter how you cut it, you can name something eel, you can't name it freshwater eel. So they bought eel, they got eel, but technically freshwater isn't a legal name. It's like boring, uninteresting. We won't, I won't uh, talk about that any further. But then there was what I'm calling the sushi problem. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency simply doesn't recognize sushi labels, and this leads to a real cultural problem. So hamachi, is not a legal term under the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Yellowtail is. Now, if you're a sushi connoisseur, you know that yellowtail is a, a, an equivalent name for Japanese amberjack, but it's not in Canada. In Canada, yellowtail can only refer to a type of sole, a flatfish. Japanese amberjack is something completely different. So if you're a sushi connoisseur and you go to a sushi restaurant and you buy hamachi or yellowtail, this is what you might expect to get, and this is actually what you got, but it's not a legal label under Canadian law. If you don't know sushi and you only know Canadian law, you expect it to get this, this is what you got, and this is a fish that can cause ciguatera poisoning. So you may have compromised your health. So there's an issue here. 
Is that what I'm calling the salmon problem? You bought something called salmon, and under uh, the inspection agency guidelines, salmon means Atlantic salmon. It doesn't mean any Pacific salmon or anything that's like salmon. It's only Atlantic salmon. What you got is rainbow trout. Nine of our, uh, we had 32 samples of salmon or Atlantic salmon. 20 of them were labeled as salmon. Nine of those were actually rainbow trout or pink salmon. So what you bought wasn't what you got. Then there's the snapper problem. Under Canadian Food Inspection Agency guidelines, red snapper refers to one of two different marine species. What you actually got is, in most cases, tilapia. In some rare cases, another form of rockfish that looks like these guys but isn't. 100% of our snapper was mislabeled. There was not a single instance of snapper or red snapper that was what it was supposed to be. And there's what I'm calling the unnecessarily specific problem, which is relatively rare. You bought Pacific cod, it was actually Atlantic cod. You bought a fish that was fine, you got something that was uh, listed as vulnerable, and this was unnecessary labeling. They didn't have to call this Pacific cod. They could have just called this cod, and it would have meant either species, but because they called it Pacific cod, they mislabeled it, uh, because it was in fact Atlantic cod. And there was this uh, fascinating instance, the not legally sold problem. We had a student who purchased something called sea eel. That's just not on the list. What in the world is sea eel? There, it's not a common name for anything. It's not a, an acceptable market name for anything. It came back as the punctuated snake eel, which isn't on the CFIA fish list. This is a fish that technically shouldn't be sold in Canada. But there it was in the Calgary fish market. We actually had a second example of this. Uh, it was a dagger tooth pike conjure eel. It's a deep sea fish. But the barcode uh, came back as unidentifiable because I don't think anybody's ever actually sampled that species and put it into the database. So I couldn't include it uh, in this list. Then there were 12 other sort of random mislabelings. There's just some random fish that wasn't what you thought it was. So I actually went to a pub and I bought cod and what I got was southern blue whiting. This is a, a South American or New Zealand uh, fish. And there are some other just random instances of this. So a lot of rampant mislabeling going on in Canada, at least in Calgary, and this seems consistent with what they found in Vancouver, uh, Montreal, and uh, Toronto. No, yeah, thank you. Now the legal labeling is also kind of interesting. We had 51 legally named samples that were, what I'm saying, precisely labeled. See, as the consumer bought something, and based on the label, you know exactly what kind of species you're consuming, and it turns out that's exactly what you got. You bought Atlantic salmon, not just salmon, but Atlantic salmon, and it always came back as Atlantic salmon, for instance. But 67 of these instances of proper labeling had legally ambiguous labels. So you bought tuna, and legally tuna can refer to any species of tuna, which there's like some like 15 different species of tuna. So the label tuna refers to 15 different things, potentially, some of which are critically endangered. And it comes back as a critically endangered fish, <laughs> in some instances, anyways. And then the other, uh, what I'm calling legally labeled, are actually unresolved barcodes. So you bought Pacific halibut, and the barcode returned, well, it could be Pacific halibut, it could be Atlantic halibut, there's no way to know. So within what we can say about the legality, it seems like it's legal, but we can't rule out mislabeling. So a large proportion of mislabeling going on. And this mislabeling is not random. Sushi was the largest contributor to mislabeling. About 45% of our sushi samples are mislabeled, as opposed to about 20% of our grocery store and uh, fish market vendors. And about 20% of the restaurant, but our sample size was extremely small for restaurants. So sushi seems to be a larger contributor, and as I said, this is in part a cultural thing that the CFIA just doesn't recognize sushi labels, which leads to a problem. But there are also instances where the sushi vendors were just incorrectly labeling things. They would sell ahi tuna, which technically means yellowfin tuna, and it came back as bluefin, or big eye tuna, something completely different. Or you bought red tuna, which should mean bluefin tuna, and it came back as a cheaper form of tuna. What was really fascinating, and this is sort of the take home message for me, is that ambiguous labels provided, they provide more flexibility for vendors. If you label something tuna, there's more than one species it can refer to. Label something cod, there's more than one species it can refer to. And yet that ambiguous labeling led to higher rates of mislabeling. If it was ambiguously labeled, it was twice as likely to be mislabeled than if the exact species had been labeled. 
So to tie this together to human flourishing and, and fish flourishing, there are a number of consequences to this mislabeling that I'll briefly go through. There are economic consequences. You bought snapper, you got tilapia. Tilapia is cheaper, you just got ripped off. Essentially, every time you buy snapper, you're getting ripped off. So there's an economic consequence to this. There are health consequences. This is an actual example from our study. You bought butterfish, you got escalar. Escalar has been called the most dangerous of the marketable fishes. It's also known as the X-lax fish. It contains a series of fats that's just really hard for us to digest. And, uh, and especially pregnant women can have tremendous gastrointestinal problems that wind them up in the hospital. Butterfish is a commonly mislabeled uh, fish, as is white tuna. White tuna is often escalar. I can also guarantee if you've eaten fish, uh, it's... I'm going to say it, you've eaten something that's endangered. Almost certainly. You, the equivalent of eating a panda bear. Uh, because our mislabeling is just so rampant, and sometimes endangered things are being marketed as non-endangered things. So we had a student who bought Pacific cod, it came back as actually Atlantic cod. They ate Atlantic cod, a fishery that uh, is listed as vulnerable and on the way to uh, being endangered. And there's also a flourishing issue for the fish themselves. Red snapper is actually not doing that well in the wild. And studies have shown that when you flood the market with things called red snapper that aren't actually red snapper, the public thinks that red snapper is doing just fine and they don't invest in conservation efforts. And so you might think, well, it's great that I'm not actually eating red snapper, but it's not that great. <laughs> it, it still causes harm. So our fisheries are at the breaking point. This is a study from 2003, and things haven't gotten any better. About a third of our fish stocks are collapsed. Uh, another 40% uh, are overexploited, and the majority are now fully exploited. So right, we're really at the point of maximally harvesting our fish species, and we've gone above that in many cases. I think correctly naming the stuff on the ground is an important first step in ensuring the flourishing of both the fish uh, and of us. So proper food labeling is essential to both humans and fish. It has economic and health consequences for us, even moral consequences, and it has conservation consequences for the fish. And the issue is greater than what is currently legal. Ambiguous labeling is not helping the fish. So as stewards, we determine, I believe, whether God's blessing is fulfilled. So thank you very much, and hopefully there's still time for questions. So are you connecting with the Canadian uh, Food Inspection Agency with this data? Yeah, so um, Oceana is a, a not-for-profit not organization, sort of a watchdog thing for this. Ocean that, wise? Oh, uh, Oceana, this group here, um, and they've done a lot of work in the United States. They just opened an office in Ottawa, and so uh, we're sharing data. They just used um, our initial data in a uh, in a first report on the mislabeling problem in Canada, and they're working in conjunction with the government, as is the University of Guelph, to start uh, figuring out how to solve this problem. So one issue is whether mislabeling is happening. Um, in the restaurants or the grocery stores, are they the ones mislabeling, or are they receiving things that have already been mislabeled and they don't know? So the CFIA is starting to sample things at the warehouses to see where the problem lies, and what we're doing now is building up a data set in Calgary uh, before any legislative changes happen, and then we can continue it after legislative changes happen and see if there's any on-the-ground difference. Um, I was wondering a few things. One was, did you tell the people you were testing about your project, either before or after? No, no, and, and um, so because this is a, it's an undergraduate project, uh, this can't be used in a court of law for anything, uh, but it can still be used as uh, publishable data, and the uh, sequences themselves are put into the Barcode Alight database online, and it's freely available, including the locations, to all members of the public. But it's just not, it can't be used in a court case. Uh, but, but are they vulnerable to prosecutions for mislabeling? Well, no, they're not because there's no way of knowing who's actually responsible for this mislabeling. Um, I think it would be a really tricky issue. Now, that said, uh, there was a, a, a huge case in the United States where um, a massive corporation was knowingly sending out rainbow trout as salmon. And they were sending it to all these grocery stores and restaurants. Grocery stores and restaurants weren't responsible, they had no idea. 
But these guys were, and they were fined. I, I can't remember the value. It was in the millions to billions. It was an enormous fine um, to try to prevent this from happening. Now, when we got rainbow trout, it was the first time that had ever been found in Canada, rainbow trout instead of salmon. Um, and so we thought maybe there was a sequencing error, which can happen, uh, or some sort of contamination. So we contacted the vendors, and the vendors told us, yeah, of course it's rainbow trout. We get them imported from Norway. And then they sent me papers showing that rainbow trout are genetically related to salmon. So in their minds, it wasn't a, an issue. Because they're not educated in labeling laws. And the CFIA has not focused on this as a, as a big issue. They've been worrying about horses in the grocery stores and the treatment of pigs. Um, and haven't really been focusing on fish labeling. I think it's ocean wise in my group. Do I have that? There is ocean wise as another group. No, that, yeah. that group though has, uh, in fact, I once went to a dinner served by some high school students yeah. in a Christian school yeah. that said all this food and they, they laid it out, this is ocean wise. Yeah. And I think that that's the kind of thing that needs for the public. Uh, so connecting with these organizations is the way to go. Yeah, no, OceanWise has been great in, in um, assessing the sustainability of fisheries, and if something is from a sustainable fishery, they'll give it a stamp of approval. That doesn't mean, though, that what you have on your plate is actually what they thought you had. Yes. Um, so uh, a really interesting study for the future would be to compare OceanWise labeled products to and Marine Stewardship Council, things with these stamps of approval, to things that don't have that stamp of approval. One of the problems is a lot of the things that are stamped like that are canned. And the canning process destroys DNA. So we tried to do canned tuna, and it was very rare that we got any recoverable DNA from that process. So that, that, that's a problem. You have no identification uh, capabilities at all for a lot of our canned tuna. Yeah. I understand that, at least from the Great Lakes area, a lot of raw fish gets frozen and sent to China. Yeah. And we buy the products yeah. that have actually been put into tins yeah. and other forms yeah. uh, that have actually been done in China, not in Canada, and I think all kinds of things can happen in that process. Yes, our labeling laws are incredibly insufficient uh, because they don't track where the fish go once they've been harvested. They can go to multiple countries, and it's just the last processing place that gets the label of a product of Thailand or something like this. Uh, but it could have been fish from Canada. And every way along the line, there's a massive black market uh, so industry going on with uh, intentionally mislabeling fish overseas and then bringing them into Canada. Uh, it's, it's, it's not an easy solution. Some things that have been proposed include when the fish land, they get their own unique identification tag that then follows them through every step of the way so you can tr go online and track where your, this fish currently is, where it's been processed, um, and then there's some accountability that way. Um, and European countries are looking at these sorts of options, but Canada is so far behind on these labeling laws. Yeah. One final question. Yes. Oh, do you suggest that as consumers we begin at uh, the restaurant level when we're ordering fish to hold the uh, vendor accountable? Yeah, so the problem is not knowing if it's the vendor or, or who's doing this, but I, I'd, I'd say this data suggests um, purchasing fish that have been precisely labeled because mislabeling is less likely in that case. And then that puts pressure to be precisely labeling everything rather than having these ambiguous uh, labels, tuna, what does tuna mean? Uh, and that, that's a good first step, and it gets the vendors thinking through, what kind of tuna are we selling anyways? It doesn't guarantee that what you're eating is accurate, but it may diminish that by 50%. Sometimes I've noticed on menus that the price doesn't seem to be what I'm used to paying. <laughs> I'm coming from New Brunswick, and yeah. I eat a lot of fish, yeah. and I order a lot of fish in restaurants. Yeah. And so sometimes I said to the waitress, no, you're selling halibut for that price. That doesn't sound like it's a lot of money. She said, well, that's what it says there. And we, I said, you sell this all the time? Well, yeah, every day. And we never get a little defense. And I said, well, could you just ask the chef if it is halibut? If you want, you can say, I'm a picky customer. I'm from the East Coast. And, yeah. you know. and so literally they come back, well, no, I guess it wasn't halibut. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah, that's tough. I've heard stories of snapper coming into grocery stores and has two labels, snapper on one side, tilapia on the other. And so they know that it's tilapia and they just take the tilapia label off and sell it as snapper. Um, yeah, so there is stuff on the ground that's happening for sure, but you can't always assume that. You know, it's, it's, it's a difficult problem. But yeah, you can use your pocketbook to, to um, vote uh, and you can write in to uh, your member of uh, whatever it is, politics.
politics. For your politics. <laughs> uh, and particularly the Canadian Food Inspection Agency and, and start demanding better labeling laws. We don't have to say how the fish was caught, what stock it was from, any of these things that other countries do that are really important for you as a consumer to know if what you're eating is sustainable. Good. Well, uh, we need to thank Matthew Morris for... Uh...